Hey guys, Frank Berry here with another episode of Modern Church Leader uh, coming to you live. Excited about today's episode. Um, you know, as you know, in the church world, uh, church leaders are always dealing with empowering volunteers, engaging volunteers, keeping them inspired and going. And uh, today we're going to have a great show where we're going to really talk about how church leaders can empower volunteers. Uh, we've got a great guest lined up uh, who I'm really excited to chat with today. So I'm going to bring him in real quick and we'll jump in. Uh, hey, Jeff, how's it going? What's up, Frank? It's going good to, well. Good to see you. So uh, everybody, this is Jeff Martin. He is the executive director of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And uh, Jeff, man, it's great to have you on the show today. It's great to be here. Great to yeah. be here. Um, I love to give people just a bit of the, the background of our guests. So would you mind taking a few minutes? Just tell us about your kind of journey into ministry and how'd you end up at FCA and mm -hmm. uh, what's it like to be the executive director there? Yeah, well, uh, uh, thanks for having me. Um, my journey was uh, you know, just called by the Lord uh, right when I got out of college, went to seminary uh, at, at a Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, went after an MDiv, spent four years, oh my goodness, going after that and um, uh, was married while I was there and then started with a church immediately out of seminary, spent four years at a large uh, uh, church in Oklahoma. Okay. And during that time uh, ran into, uh, we were, we were ministering to kids from like 36 different schools and um, just started doing some things with the FCA, the fellowship of Christian athletes on yep. some of the campuses and ran into one of their area reps supported them, helped them. And, and then uh, a position opened up in Southwest Oklahoma. And uh, my wife and I felt called to go there. So we left the church and uh, started a new position, new office there in Southwest Oklahoma. And we're there for 14 years. Okay. And then, uh, then accepted a position at our national headquarters in Kansas City for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and have been there, I think, golly, going on 15 years. Um, so it's been about a 26 year, uh, uh ministry process. And, uh, and, and so I'm serve, I'm currently serving as executive director of strategic partnerships okay. for FCA. And so that's, that's domestic and global, just trying to, uh, again, this, this global, the, the world and, and the way that we're, we were able to minister around the world, it's, you can't do it alone. And so my job is to be very strategic on seeking out partners, not only that, that can that we can serve, but that can serve us in our mission. So that's what I've been doing. That's sort of my uh, story, ministry story. Yeah, and and I saw in uh, just some of the writer before we got started here, like you started a big event or an event that mm -hmm. turned pretty big. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit about that? You know, tell us about the event, and I think it ties into engaging volunteers because you probably have hundreds and hundreds if not, I don't know, thousands of volunteers that are helping put this thing on. So mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, while we were serving in the field, um, you know, ministers do all types of events. We do, right. you know, we're always trying to figure out what, what's a way and, uh, you know, to reach people with the gospel and, and make disciples and all that. So we tried all types of things. And, and uh, but one of these events really took hold. And um, but the idea was to bring everyone in a community into one place and to share a challenge to read the word of God and to accept Christ. It was very simple. Uh, but the, the difference was the key, the, the heroes of the program, we were going to make students. And that was very countercultural at that time. It probably still is and to give the mic to these volunteers these, and have them share that message. Mm. And the, the prevailing idea was always that you had to have like the expert, you know, the, you know, like you and me, like the older guys and gal, you know, talking to these it, kids and they just know. spectators. Right. I'm not sure I'd put myself in the expert category. <laughs> I'm trying hard. <laughs> so, uh, or th yeah, the potential experts maybe, but, uh, but yeah, throw that, throw, you know, you always had to have some type of a hook is what everyone right. said. And we, right. we sort of did this thing said, you know, we, we just believe based on the story of Josiah and second Chronicles 34, that if we got them all in one place and, and gave them the mic and they're the heroes and they're sharing, even though they might not be really good, yeah. we thought that might work. Yeah. And so that was where Fields of Faith started. And we did that. There was about 17 communities in, in the southwest part of the state of Oklahoma and then in, in Texas and in different places there. 
And what happened is that that was so, so real. And these students identified with each other, listening to each other, that it, it really took hold. And it, it just it, it, it just created this movement. And pretty soon it jumped into other states and became a national event to the point where after about 16 years, we've had approximately over 2 million people attend these, these uh, stadium rallies. Normally there's about 500 uh, uh, rallies, not during COVID, but 500 stadiums and small, mm -hmm. it could be five kids up to 15,000 right. at, at different rallies. But it's, it's really the, co the core, the heart of it is really students sharing that message. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, just a side note, how did you respond in COVID or how are you responding in COVID with that event? Did you guys change anything up? Did you cancel it? <laughs> yeah. Well, guys... Yeah. We, we uh, left it up to, you know, the, the people, the, the, the people best suited to for answers are the ones closest to the problems. And so okay. organizationally we just said, Hey, <clears throat> you can do that. We have some protocols that like our, our staff would have to check in and, but churches can do it without, our staff. I mean, it's just whoever. It's a very simple program, and if they feel led, we just hand that out and say, "Go do it." But pr just listen to the protocols of the local, regional, state. Some of them were able to meet in in person. Others they did digital, just like right. anything else that was going on in churches. So. Right, right. Gotcha. Okay, so it can be uh, ha handled regionally, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. Um, how many like? In, in this context, and I don't know all the details of the event, but just from a volunteer standpoint, like what percentage of the the event is really kind of led and put on by volunteers? Yeah. So like, for instance, when I was in the field and first started it, we ha I had uh, 17 of these in different stadiums in, around the, the southwest part of the state. Yeah. I only helped run one of them. So all, you know, a, a lot of these areas, it, it's not like you have to, you, you, it's like some paid FCA staff person or something like right. that that's running it, that normal. And that's the key is that it's, it's volunteers. And so you're going to have uh, normal, but you're going to have to have some organization. But for instance, we have one, one stadium rally. Uh, it brings 60 churches together. Uh, they have hundreds of volunteers that wow. no one's being paid, nothing like there's no central organizational structure as far as paid staff that run fields of faith. It's mm -hmm. just a website. And so um, it, it's primarily made up of volunteers through through churches, local FCA staff, uh, coaches, teachers, business people. They all just come together around it. And that's what makes it so unique is that you rarely see that anymore. Yeah. And uh, so pr primarily, I'd say, <laughs> oh, my gosh, the percentage is almost it's, it's way up there. Volunteer yeah. Led. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and it's hard. I mean, engaging volunteers, uh, keeping them inspired, keeping them motivated, you know, keeping them excited about the work they're doing, uh, especially if they've been doing it for a while, you know, doing it mm -hmm. for a few years or more. Um, that's it's really, really hard work. Um mm -hmm. Let me pause for a quick set. So we got a bunch of people watching live. Um, if you're with us live, thanks for joining us today. Uh, make sure to give the show uh, a like or just drop, you know, the name of your church, where you're from, uh, kind of what you guys are up to in this season of COVID in the comments uh, and say hi to Jeff. Um, we've got a great guest on today. And uh, if you have questions for Jeff along the way, also pop those in the comments uh, and we'll try to get to some of those. Um, Jeff, did this event inspire your passion for like volunteerism and leading volunteers? Yeah, I think it's one of those things. I don't know if it, ins it inspired what it did. I think it shocked me. You know, like, again, as, as ministers, we're always working volunteers. Yeah. It gave me a different view of what's there. Uh, and really, as God was sort of leading, it wasn't some great idea that I came up with. But, but the central thought was um, just watching it watching this happen of what watching the, uh, the these the result and what sprang up and the ownership that happened was different than what we normally did yeah. and what I like to say is and I've worked with thousands of volunteers over 30 years and what I like to say is that we we have to as leaders of volunteers we have to have management we we do need to manage we need to 
we need to recruit, we need to train, we need to give all of these different things that we, we, we have to do that. And that's what I always did. But every now and again, you can sprinkle in there something that, that you don't manage a volunteer, you move them. And so you create movement within management and, and you see the lights go off in your volunteers' eyes and they step up and they, they, it's, it's beyond the normal management. And, um, and so that's what I think the passion is to capture that. How do you, you know, how do you capture that? And we looked, like I said, over 16 years, millions of people I stopped, I went, I thought this would have a shelf life. And so why don't we capture some of those principles and put it in this book? Yeah. And that's where the inspiration came from. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. And, and speaking of the book, so you, you're in pre order. So you've written a book called empower. What's the, there, is there a subtitle on it? Yes, yeah, the four keys to leading a, a a volunteer movement. Okay, and it's mm-hmm. in. So you wrote this book. Um, I'm sure a labor of love. I've never written a book, but it just strikes me as something that's probably pretty hard to do. <laughs> yes, uh, it's a lot harder than you think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's hard. So if it's harder than that, then I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'll, I'll ever get one out, but um, that's pretty cool. Um, congratulations on that. Yeah. I, I know it's an exciting time. So you're waiting for it to. Be released when's the release date yeah it's uh, i believe the middle of february like february 16th 15th something like that um will be released and, and they're taking pre-orders on it as well but that's when you can actually you know they'll start sending the books out yeah what um where can just as a plug where can folks go is it on amazon just search for empowering volunteers or something like that yeah it's on all all of the major uh platforms um you can go i i would encourage everyone to go to empoweryourvolunteers.com and that's where information on the book is. There'll be other items there for bulk orders and, and uh, just any other press covering stuff like that. And it'll show you all the different ways you can interact with the book yeah. and down that. Love it. Well, uh, David Moon says, hi, Jeff, please save me. I have a volunteer shortage. So, David, go go get the book. <laughs> that's, that's definitely yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, okay. The, the book sounds awesome. And I know that there's kind of four key principles in the book. You want to just outline those for us and, and talk to us briefly about each of them? Yeah. It's, uh, um, it, it, it's interesting when you're, you're looking at something you've been doing for so many years, you go, what are the, what, you know, what's the core principles in there that, mm-hmm. you know, it takes time to do that because there's so many moving parts and things like that. But the four that we found out was the first one is the word value. And um, when you show volunteers value, and, and I, I probably was the worst at this because my thing was, I, it's like we have this organization, we have our goals, we know we're going to go, we're going to take that hill. Now, if you want to come be a part of it, great. If not, get out of the way, we're moving, right? Like we're, that, that's, that was sort of my mindset of, of going at. So what I, I, I think what I looked at was there were people that wanted to be a part of it, volunteers, one that I didn't, didn't appreciate. But what happens is the volunteers can feel like they're a cog in the organizational machine, right? Mm-hmm. And I, and again, I was one of the worst at that. And I was, I was like, I'm doing you a favor. I'm letting you be a part of what we're doing because this is so exciting, right? And, right. and uh, but they can, you can get to be where you feel like you're just this cog. And, and so we involve volunteers, we roll them up into our organization and then, we, then the organization goes. <clears throat> and so the, the idea of value is not, it's not just involving them, but we're turning it where the organization looks at the volunteer and go, you have great influence and we want to help release that. Right. And here's some ways to do that. But you, just a shift, just that shift, like and in, in on the, the cover of the book is a microphone. And what we did is just with Fields of Faith and the book is not just about Fields of Faith, but the idea was instead of us having the microphone, we gave them the microphone. So this and when you do that, you you heighten the elevate, you elevate the expectation of them at times, not all the time, but you insert this in, you heighten it, and then you include them. You go, Hey, how do you think we should achieve this? And so you, you, you include them. And I like to say there's a difference between prescribe uh, to, you know, we like to prescribe a pill to our volunteers. So there's a difference between where we go, take this pill you shift it to, we want to, we want you to help us make this pill. So you involve them. So you include them and you elevate at times. And here's the deal, Frank, in va- when you talk about value, every one of our volunteers deep inside of them, they want to be part of something 
Yeah. Epic. They do. They, and again, this isn't all the time. I say that over and over, you'll wear them out, but they want to be part of something epic. They want to be part of, of going against all odds. They, they want to take on something, not just take in things. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you can insert that, you're showing them value because you do not trust what you don't value. Right. And so you show them trust. All of us have been there where someone goes, I believe you can do this. And by the way, if you don't show up, we, we don't, we can't hit it. And they go, Oh my gosh, they value me. So that's the first thing. The second would is simplicity. And it's, it's looking at everything. If you're, and again, you're talking about movements. If you throw a bunch of stuff out there, volunteers are busy. I mean, there's a lot of things going on and they're like, you know, cats with a laser pointer many times that we lead them and we're telling them all these things to do. Just yeah. hold the laser point steady and go, this is for movement. This is very, this is what we're going to do very clear. The third would be uh, uh, commonality. So uh, what we talk about there is we have common goals. We have common, you know, we, there's things that we look at to sort of create everyone going the same direction. What we talk about in the book is one way to look at that is identify a common enemy that rallies people. If there, there's an enemy at the gate, it brings yeah. everyone together. Right, and right. this isn't about people or groups or things like that. Our, our common enemy, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? And so to identify what is it that we want to do? What do we want to bring down? Mark Green uh, with Hobby Lobby did a great job with this. He, on one of their, the things they were working together with, he said, um, th this partnership we're working on, we want to eradicate Bible poverty. That was what they, they were doing. I thought that may... That got my attention. It wasn't, we want to distribute all of these Bibles. That was part of it. Because, hey, we have a goal to distribute 7,000 Bibles, da, 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 da. No, he said, we want to eradicate Bible poverty. Well, right. What he was saying is, that is the enemy. Poverty, biblical poverty is the enemy, and we're going to bring it down. Well, volunteers want to be part of something like that. So that's just an example. So what's a common enemy? And the last thing is ownership. That's the last point is ownership. People, if, if you show them value, you keep keep it simple what you're asking them to do. And you you identify not only common goals and things like that, but look at it from a common enemy. What do we want to bring down? They will own that. The, that that's the result. And we say what, what happens is we don't want them to attend a concert. We want them to be the concert. And so when when you do that, that ownership and you can see it in their eyes, so those are the four principles. And they're like, and Frank, they're sort of like, uh, they're spices in the mix. They're, they're, this isn't a system. It's like you can, in, in, maybe you can insert some of these a little bit here, a little bit there and help create that movement within your right. management. Right, right. I, I mean, I love that. And I know there's a, a ton that we can unpack on each of them. Um, and, I, and I know your last 15 years or so is at FCA. Uh, but a lot of our audience here, like pastors and church leaders, like how do you think you can apply these principles in the church context, you know, in terms of empowering, engaging, uh, you know, getting new volunteers, kind of all these things like uh, and, you know, you've been around the church for a long time. So mm -hmm. how can how can pastors take some of these things and bring them into leading volunteers in their church? Yeah, I think it, uh, just a, a couple of examples. One example is when I was leading a large church and we had 36, uh, we had Sunday school, right? And yeah. the small groups, 30, we had 36 different in our group. <clears throat> and one of the principles I inserted there was we would do like a high attendance Sunday and things like and everyone did it. And we would, we would hire someone to come in and we'd feed pizza, you know, something always entertaining and stuff. The shift that we, we made is one time I just looked at volunteers and I said, I said, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to ask our students, we're going to include them and go, what is it you would like to learn? Like, what is it you'd like to learn? And so they identified four different things. And I said, well, who do you think we should have speak on this? So we, we brought in, everything was volunteer led. Yeah. So the kids were leading it. We were still doing Sunday school, still doing the same thing. We just flipped. We, we, we included them. We showed value what they wanted to do. Yeah. Then I told I told our, our uh, student leaders, uh, uh, the, the Sunday school teachers, I go, it's up to you to get them there we're, with this high attendance thing, right? And so they were like, well, what are we supposed to do? And I go, you got to figure, like, what do you want to do? And so what happened, it had unleashed this innovation and, and at first they were like, okay, we'll sort of do that. Well, I went to our, I went to our staff meeting and everyone was going around the table. What are you going to do for high attendance? 
And it got to me. I said, well, I'm not doing anything. And they're like, what? And I go, I, I just think we're just going to ask them what they want to do. And I'm going to lean on the, on these, these volunteer leaders to make it happen. They go, that sounds a little bit like, I don't know if you're going to be able to do that. It sounds a little bit lazy. <laughs> so I went back and I told our volunteer leaders that, well, guess what? It was like, all right, this high challenge, there's this elevation. And they came up with, the, they did sleepovers. They, they wanted van, they borrowed vans. They were going and picking people up. They did. I mean, it was this, uh, uh, again, the same thing we always did, but we, we brought in, we valued them and said, there's no way we're going to get there unless you show up. Yeah. Now we did that one time. We didn't do it all the time, but that's an example. We value, kept it very simple, gave them the intent. All right. There's this common, you know, we, we there's this common goal and then uh, they owned it and it was incredible. And I, I guarantee you the users, the, the people that are listening on this could give, give tons of examples, but yeah. that was something. And you can look at what you're doing. If, even if you just go, Hey, Let's look at everything we're doing. Is it simple? Are we communicating things? Are we asking too much? Yeah. Or you may have to elevate a little bit. So it's this edge. You're right on this edge. But I think a lot of it is just assessing and seeing, you know, just asking those questions and overlaying it uh, to see what those opportunities are there for you. But again, this is not a system. It's not a program. It's sort of like it's, it's just principles and just sort of overlay them to see if we could do those better. Yeah. I love, you know, you've mentioned it a couple of times, just the idea of you, you have to challenge people to, to an extent, like you have to insert some element of them rising to the challenge and, and you know, attaining the goal kind of like, and then not just be something that's super simple all the time. Mm -hmm. um, like, do you have any other examples of that or any more uh, I want to shed more light on this idea of like, you know, challenging your volunteers to rise up uh, mm -hmm. and kind of what that, I don't know, that seems like it brings accountability and ownership all at the same time uh, mm -hmm. if they challenge. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, uh, Frank, is the, the tendency, it's very counterintuitive because I, I, I would do this. I would go to my volunteers and I got to the point where, you know, they're always busy. They're always doing things and everything. Where I was apologizing when I would ask them to do something, and, right? You know, yeah. it's just like you, you know, just well, I know you're busy. And, you know, I, I, I wish you could do this, and and you know, you don't have to. But and so what we do is we lower the bar. Yeah. So then when they step over it, then we can go, man, I'm a, I'm a pretty good leader. Yeah, you know, I got them. You know, like we we did that, and 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 so the opportunity exists for you to you know, at times go, okay, we're going to do this together and I want to include you in this. And um, we may or may not make it, but I think this is something and it's, a, and that's that deal called vision and you get that in front of them and you, you're able to do that. But there's, yeah, uh, there's, there's a variety of ways that, that I've done that. And I would just say even fields of faith was that I, I took, I didn't add new volunteers. We went to the ones we already had <clears throat> and we just said, you know, we, we talked to them about, you know, common enemy that we're losing in our culture that we're always on defense. If you're always on defense, you're never going to win. Mm -hmm. So when do we go on offense? And the yeah. key simple thing for us was the word of God is the only offensive weapon. And we started asking around and we realized a lot of people weren't engaging in the word of God. And these are people in, in the churches and in, in our huddles and in schools and stuff. And so we just kept it simple and said, we need to engage the word of God, God and start going on offense. If we're going to, otherwise we're going to get overrun in our culture. Yeah. And so that's the message that I gave to our volunteers. And, and I said, let's, let's go, let's go after it. So, a very high deal, a very high challenge. And you, you saw the value, you saw the spine straighten up as we challenged with this. And we said, we want to fill stadiums with the entire community to hear kids give a challenge to read the word of God. That's what we want to do. Can you see it? And then they're like, yes. And guess what happened? Stadiums started getting filled, yeah. not only where we were, but all, all across the country. And now it's happening in India in South Korea, in Africa, because uh, it's so simple and easy to do, but it's a high challenge. And people are looking for that. Yeah. And then, and then there's momentum, right, that kicks in and, and people are what, – what was the um, – in, in terms of this event, was there like a marquee moment where you like 
you know, fill the stadium that you were trying to, you know, conquer and it happened? Like, what was the first one? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Could I tell you a real quick story? Yeah, that would, uh, okay. So, so at the first one, I'd gone to all, a lot of people, advisors, and these are guys who've been in ministry a long time, business people. I go, Hey, this idea, I think, what do you think? You think it worked? And it, over majority said it won't because you got to have a hook. We already talked about it. You have to have this hook, right. this special person, everything. And they said, what are you going to do if it rains? And because we had to schedule a stadium, I go, we'll just go in the gym. We'll schedule a gym. And they right. go, have you ever spoken in a gym? That's even worse. It, it'll be a worse. So if you put a kid up there in front of kids, uh, all, you know, all these other kids, if they even show up because there's no special guest or anything, but if you get in there and you're in a gym, they're not going to listen because it bounces, sound bounces. And so that kid's going to be stuck up there and it's going to be humiliating. It's going to be awful. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, we'll, we'll just pray it doesn't rain. Well, yeah. we go, we do the first one. Guess what happens? <laughs> it rains. So we move inside and, and I didn't think anyone was going to come. And it's like, well, it's a good idea. No one's going to come. There's like no special guests. And guess what? They came. All these churches brought people, all the, the huddles, all this stuff. We had over, over a thousand kids smashed into this small college gym. And the first speaker up was this little girl. And she was a little ninth grader. She had a bow in her hair. And she walked up there in front of the crowd. And I was sitting there and I go, what have I done? Like, she's going to get destroyed. Like, this is going to be awful. And she says this. She says, she goes, my name's so-and-so. And she pulled, she goes, if I got in a fight, I could use this. And she pulls out a little Gerber knife, just undoes it and sort of pokes it, right? And I'm yeah. like, what is she do you know, doing? <laughs> and then she reaches down and picks up a samurai sword. She unsheaths it, just like, shing. And she starts going through this routine. Well, I didn't know that she was like a martial arts specialist in, in weaponry and stuff. Yeah. And she's flipping and twirling. I'm like, how did she get the weapon in here? And I hope she doesn't let go. And I was just trying to think of the safety thing, right? And she's <laughs> flipping through that. She goes back to the mic and she goes, the Bible says of itself that it's the only offensive weapon you know, in, in, in the armor of God. And yeah. she goes, so if I'm going to use it, I don't want to use it like this. And she held up the little knife. She goes, I want to use it like this, like this sword. And she goes, that's why I read it every day. It changes. It, it, it's changed my life. It helps me know what I need to do every day. And I just want to challenge you to join me. Thank you. She Crushed goes her Bible and walks off the place. You could have heard a pin drop. And I went, oh, my gosh. Next kid gets up. Next kid stumbling, bumbling chasing rap. I mean, you know, that, that type of deal, but they listened. And afterwards uh, I got up and said, you heard what they said. You can respond this way. And they came down over the rails. So many people want to come down and pray and all that stuff. And I went, Oh my gosh, we're on to something. And we started hearing that from other events, uh, you, you know, that night. And that's when we knew unleashing that volunteer, empowering that volunteer was going to do something special. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, what a moment, right? To sit there and watch the first one. Uh, oh, yeah. Just, I still go back to it. And so it was it, like, again, I it, it was overwhelming. It, I wish I could say, oh, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. I yeah. was scared to death because I I was handing off the mic to a volunteer. That that was a high risk, you know. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's that was the experience. That's great. Um, let's jumping back to kind of pastors and church leaders in the context of you know, raising up volunteers, empowering this movement of volunteers. What's the biggest mistake that you see or have seen over the years? Yeah, well, I would say when it comes to movement, again, we're not talking about management. There's a lot of things when we talk about, and management might be more too much of a business term, but we do have to manage volunteers. We have to care for them. We yeah. have to sure. make sure that we're meeting with them and that they're resourced. And th this is not this is not replacing that. But when it comes to movement, I would say, Frank, that the biggest thing, and I, and I mentioned it briefly, and this is what I did, the hardest thing is to, uh, I think, to take the risk to trust them, all right? Because what we tend to do as leaders is we want to control situations. We want to we want to tell them this is what you need to do. And now we can predict the outcome. We know exactly what they're doing. And so when you're talking about mo movement, at times to be able to put in there and go, you know, they may or may not show up. They're volunteers. They're, they are not employees of my organization. Okay. I can't fire them. I can't, I used to want to fire. I was like, if I could just fire a volunteer, you know, no, 
and uh, it, it, but they aren't. And so what right. we do is it's hard for us to trust to hand over some of these things that are, if they don't show up, it doesn't happen. And that's a risk and mm -hmm. it may or may not work. And I've had things blow up in my face, but it takes a risk and you have to trust them. But when you do, when you do in certain situations and you go, listen, you've got, you, if you don't show up, it doesn't happen. They realize that you're asking something great of them. And like I said, every one of them already has that in their heart and you're unlocking something in their heart right. and they know they're not being managed. They know you're trusting them and risking them. But I would say for the leader, that's one of the hardest things to do. That story I just shared about, about that little samurai girl. I was terrified leading up to that, that whole time because it was a risk. And so that would be one of the things that, and I still, I still have to deal with that. Like, you know, just handing things off. I'm not talking about things that are just handing every the reins and it's just a free for all. It's little steps of risk. It's little steps of trust. You put those together based on your knowledge to allow that to happen. So I would say that might be one of the biggest mistakes. Yeah, I love that. Um, I guess as we kind of come towards the end here, I don't want to go too long, but how have you seen COVID impact the <laughs> like the ability to engage and inspire volunteers. Um, mm -hmm. Like obviously we've translated to this online kind of digital world. Everybody's on zoom. Um, but have you, you know, again, I'm kind of trying to go from the context of the church, like mm -hmm. really staying engaged with your volunteers. Um, what's working, what's changed, what can pastors be doing to operate well in this online world? Yeah, well, I think across the board, obviously, the digital, the, the, you know, the, the digital opportunities and think about it. When COVID hit, it, it took our normal uh, operating procedures and just blew them up where, it, you know, involving people in the church, have everyone come and be in a building and you run your programs. That blew that up. Right. And what I heard, I'm at the I'm at the table with some of the top program, you know, uh, organizations literally in the world, everyone was gathering together going, how are we going to deal with this? And you started hearing this word emerge called empower. <laughs> We've got to empower because the, our, our volunteer leaders are out there, but they're still with their, you know, they're not coming in here, but they still have access to a lot of the people that are right around them. And so we really have to hand that off and get serious about this. We've said it before, but now we don't have any option. We have to empower. And so I would say um, that the opportunity came to really, you know, connect with them and really hand that off because they literally couldn't bring them to our leaderships, right? In the, in the church, we want to get back to that. And that's important. Um, so I think COVID has really put a spotlight on the importance of empowering of seeing our volunteer leaders as those that we send out, not roll up, right? We're not just rolling them up in the church, but we want to send them out to have an influence in the community that they're at. And so through digital means, uh, having them lead, you know, lead, stu lead studies, lead online studies with those around them. Some of them, you know, meeting in the, in their, uh, uh, in their driveways and, and those type of things, it's all happening outside the church. And there's a variety of ways that's happened, but I think a lot of it's now digital in nature. That's not going to go away. I think it's going to make the church better in different ways. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the idea of being serious about handing off uh, a lot of this and trusting our volunteer leaders, COVID has put a spotlight on it and how important that is because the, the ministries that had done that, they just continued to roll. The ones that were all based on coming, you know, coming to a facility had to struggle with that. And I think there's going to be some, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of new things that come out of this that are going to make the churches better. Right. But, um, but I, I think the digital platforms and then trusting them while they're out there and what they normally do as they go about their life, that's become, um, that's been heightened the importance of empowering them. Yeah. Just really practically in terms of communicating and connecting with volunteers um, how did you do it in your church days uh, or even running these, mm -hmm. you know, big events? Was it a, a, a weekly volunteer <laughs> meeting? Was it text messages, zoom, zoom calls, I mm -hmm. guess, like, you know, what was the, 
kind of cadence of connection and communication with volunteers? Yeah, I think it's consistency. You know, we would meet weekly. Um, and then if there were something that was that was going to be, you know, like an outreach event or something special, a little bit beyond the normal organizational procedures that, again, that we all need that provide that consistency, then we might have a special meeting for that. Um, but I think the key is consistency yeah. with them so they understand uh, what's going on, the communication and all of those type of things would would be that. But But again, Anything that was beyond that, we would have a special meeting so we could clearly communicate what what is it we're trying, you know, what what is it we're trying to do? We we could again be simple, show them the value, show them and the challenge and all those type of things. But but normally I, I do think it needs to be a consistency uh, of when you're meeting with your volunteers because that communication is key. If yeah. you want to, if you want to mess up, and this is some of the problems that we've been facing, if you really want to uh, create havoc is you cut off communication with the center of gravity. You disrupt it, you mm -hmm. cut it off. Um, I think you remember, you know, like remember those pictures is back in the day, but when we invaded Iraq and stuff and you had that green at night and you saw all these traces, all these things yeah. going on, all that. of those, I knew a lot of those, those, um, pilots, they were taking out community. A lot of them, what they were doing is taking out communication towers. Mm -hmm. So that's just a tactic is if you want to mess up, an organization cut off the communication. So I would say that's key. The, the more you can communicate and that can be text message, but I think that, you know, the face-to-face -face is the best. Uh, when we get back to that, uh, be very consistent about the center of gravity communicating consistently and clearly with the volunteers. Yeah, no, that's, that's powerful. I love that, that analogy too. Um, mm -hmm. Really cool. Uh, all right, let's let's wrap it up with where can folks go. Let's remind everyone uh, where they can go to check out the book and mm -hmm. uh, reorder it before it comes out. Yeah, I'm so glad you didn't say uh, all of your social media handles. I'm not real good at that, but uh, but no, we do no. <laughs> we we do have a uh, empoweryourvolunteers.com it has everything there. That's the simple uh, way for people to go. Um, it has, it shows all the different platforms. The book's available on every major platform, uh, to order. And, uh, but there's some really cool things there that are available, uh, beyond that. I think we're doing a bulk order, uh, uh, option that if it, I, I can't remember the number of books, be order a number of books, we could set up a time for that perhaps I could get with your team, uh, that team and, or an individual and just spend some time just asking questions sort of like what you and I just did. Uh, yeah. uh, about some of the principles. So we're offering that out there um, as an opportunity, but they'll find that on the website, uh, empoweryourvolunteers.com. That would be the best way to go. Love it. Great domain get, by the way. That's yeah, a I know. It's it, You got to spell a lot, but uh, it, it works out all right. It's pretty simple, to, easy to remember. You'll get, what is it, empower your volunteers, mm -hmm. like eyv.com or something like, you'll get the short version. <laughs> I need to do that. <laughs> Oh, this has been awesome. Thank you for the yeah. time. Uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, Pre-congratulations on its launch. I know it's going to be a good day. Awesome. Uh, and everybody watching, appreciate you guys. It's great having you join the show. Um, make sure to go check out empoweryourvolunteers.com and uh, give the show a like, share it on YouTube or Facebook uh, to help spread the word about empowering volunteers. And uh, we will catch everybody next week, same time, same day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Frank.